Η επόμενη ομιλία μας έχει τίτλο «Γυρίζοντας τον περιοδικό πίνακα ανάποδα». Σε περίπτωση που κι εσείς όπως κι εγώ δεν θυμάστε τι ακριβώς είναι ο περιοδικός πίνακας, να σας πω απλώς πως είναι ένα από τα πιο σημαντικά εργαλεία της χημείας. Στην ουσία είναι ένα είδος λίστας, ένας κατάλογος σε μορφή πίνακα στον οποίο η ταξινόμηση των χημικών στοιχείων γίνεται με βάση τον ατομικό αριθμό, την ηλεκτρονική δομή και την περιοδικότητά τους, δηλαδή την επανάληψη των ιδιωτήτων τους με καθορισμένο τρόπο. Η λέξη κλειδί σε όλη την παραπάνω δυσνόητη παράγραφο είναι μία. Η ταξινόμηση. Η ταξινόμηση διευκολύνει και συστηματοποιεί τη γνώση, μήπως όμως την περιορίζει κιόλα. Θα μπορούσε άραγε το αναποδογύρισμα του περιοδικού πίνακα των στοιχείων να κάνει κάποιες σημαντικές πτυχές του πιο κατανοητές και να ενθαρρύνει περισσότερους ανθρώπους να σπουδάσουν χημεία. Ο καθηγητής Σερ Μάρτιν Πόλιακοφ, ένας παγκόσμιος πρωτοπόρος στον τομέα της πράσινης χημείας, πιστεύει πως ναι. Σε αυτή τη συζήτηση, λοιπόν, θα μας βοηθήσει να διερευνήσουμε την αξία του να σκεφτόμαστε έξω από το κουτί. Και πώς είναι δυνατόν, κοιτώντα κάτι υπό μια φρέσκια οπτική, να γεννηθούν νέες ιδέες και να δημιουργηθούν διαφορετικές απόψεις. Επίσης, ο καθηγητής Πόλιακοφ θα μας αποκαλύψει τους λόγους που τον ενέπνευσαν να γίνει χημικός, αλλά και τις απόψεις του για την εξέλιξη του τομέα της πράσινης χημείας στο μέλλον. Τη συζήτηση με τον καθηγητή θα συντονίσουν ο Στράτος Ασημέλης, χημικός και υποψήφιος διδάκτορας επικοινωνίας της επιστήμης, και η δόκτορ Έλενα Βενάρδου, διδάκτορ χημείας στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Νότιγχαμ στην Βρετανία, και υπεύθυνη διασφάλισης ποιότητα στην φαρμακευτική εταιρεία Berenger Ingelheim Ελλάς. Good evening. My name is uh, Stratos Asimelis. I hold an MSc degree in uh, chemistry and I'm a PhD candidate of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in the area of science communication. It is my honor to be selected by the British Council uh, in order to moderate today's interview with uh, a man whom I especially admire. Before I present uh, today's honor guest, I would uh, like to introduce the co-host of uh, today's interview, Eleni Venardo. Eleni, welcome. Hi, Strato, and thank Hi. you for the invitation. And uh, also thanks to Vangelis Kravaritis and the British Council for the invitation. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, and yeah, we, we didn't even say why we're here yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me introduce you. Um, Eleni is a chemist now working for, me, for a pharmaceutical uh, company in Greece as a qualified person. This meaning that uh, she's responsible for the quality of the products uh, released to the market by the company's manufacturing site in Koropi. However, Eleni is here today in another capacity. She's been a PhD student who's worked under the guidance of uh, our today's guest. I don't know if you feel excited to meet your professor again after such a long time, Eleni. Yes, yes. Uh, we, we've met in the meantime. Uh, there's been a few years since I graduated. It's uh, back in 2004, so we, we've mm -hmm. met ever since. But yes, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here with you and have the chance to uh, pose some questions myself together with you, to Thank him. You and uh, to, to those listening as well. So I'm sure uh, it will be quite exciting for everyone. And now it's time to present the guest of honor. Our guest is a man whose reputation and value is world renowned. He is a researcher, a professor in the area of environmental chemistry at the, the University of Nottingham, a sir, but most especially the most accessible chemist one can meet. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Martin Polyakov. Professor, welcome. Good evening and welcome. I'm delighted to be at the event, albeit remotely. And it's a great pleasure to meet you, Stratos, for the first time. And really good to see you, Eleni, <laughs> because especially at this time of pandemic, we all feel very isolated. This is true. 
Yeah. But it is a time when everybody needs chemists to make medicines and to make everything that we need. Yeah. It is a great honor to have you here today. They say it's an art to take an interview. I might not feel as much uh, of an artist today, <laughs> yet I feel extremely lucky to have you here today with us. Uh, through today's questions, I would like for us to take in some uh, more of Polyakov in our uh, hearts and minds. So let's get started. Uh, okay. Do you remember the moment when uh, you first decided you wanted to be a chemist? At what age was it? And what was the incentive uh, for this choice? Um, well, my um, grandfather and my father were both physicists. And I think that my father had decided when I was a very small boy that I would be a scientist. So I really didn't have any choice. But unfortunately, when I was a teenager at school and I thought I was going to be a physicist, I became clear that my maths wasn't good enough. And so I had a very good memory. My memory is still not bad, but when I was a child, it was very, very good. And I also liked buying books. So when I was a young teenager, I bought a lot of secondhand chemistry books and I read them all. So I knew much more chemistry than my chemistry teacher. Mm -hmm. And I think I was a terrible pupil at school. I would talk all the time to my friend John and I wouldn't listen to the teacher at all. But I could always answer the question. But once and only once I couldn't answer the question or I got the question wrong. And I've never seen anybody looking so happy as my chemistry teacher when I got the question wrong. But my chemistry teacher is now 80 years old, but we're still in touch. And in the middle of the isolation in summer last year, I and five other pupils from the chemistry class had a Zoom um, meeting with our chemistry teacher to drink his health for his 80th birthday. Mm -hmm. But I should also say that I married daughter of a physicist, my wife's mother was a physicist, my son is a physicist, so I'm the only chemist, and my wife's a mathematician. And was there, Martin, any time that you thought you had second thoughts about becoming a chemist? Did you ever regret it or think that it was something else that could be uh, your future? Um, no, I haven't, I haven't really regretted it. And I still enjoy the excitement of chemistry, the bangs, the changes of color and so on. Though I am sometimes asked by young people, what would I have done if I had not been a chemist? <laughs> yeah. And, um, I usually answer that I would have liked to make television advertisements. <laughs> and I suppose by making YouTube videos about chemistry, or at least performing on them, I don't make them myself, I'm sort of making television advertisements for chemistry. And my brother is a film director and playwright, so he actually makes films and um, you can, um, perhaps the British Council should invite him to perform <laughs> at a literary festival in <laughs> Athens. But he has only once written a play about chemistry, and which was performed 25 years ago at the um, <clears throat> National Theatre in London. And because my brother knows no chemistry, he hasn't even had, I think, one chemistry lesson, I had to write some of the dialogue. So it's the only time 
that words written by me have been performed in the National Theatre. <laughs> and when one of the characters said hexafluoroisopropanol, I was the only person in the audience who laughed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, what do you feel uh, might have been a failure in the area of chemistry on your part that was significant, and what did this teach you? Well, there have been lots of failures in my um, life. Well, I mean, there have been the most obvious failures when I have done stupid things and nearly had accidents. When I was in my doctorate, I turned the wrong tap and put a high pressure of hydrogen into a glass bulb, which exploded and pieces of glass were in my hair. And I was, in those days, we didn't wear safety glasses, so I had no side pieces on my glasses. So I was sufficiently um, worried that I actually glued side pieces onto my glasses, which I'm not sure would have been very useful. And um, then several times in my life, I think I've made really good discoveries. And then I have done what is called control experiments and shown that they're actually the experiments were rubbish. But I don't really regret those because the excitement of thinking you've discovered something is really good. Mm. And so when it turns out to be disappointing the next day, you've still had this high. But there have been a number of occasions when I've nearly made a big discovery but missed it. I did some experiments with a tungsten compound which should have led to some really quite interesting results, but then I probably did the experiment incorrectly, so I didn't get any results. And then a friend of mine repeated them and got some wonderful results. So I think one should never really worry about making mistakes. And in fact, um, I may, in my PhD thesis, what you will be writing soon, Stratos, mm -hmm. I, um, <laughs> I made a mistake in interpreting something. Fortunately, I had not published it. But um, one of my, by, uh, after my PhD, one of my students repeated the experiment or something similar and showed that although the result was OK, the observation was OK, the way that I interpret it was completely wrong. Mm. And it gave him huge pleasure to prove that the professor was wrong. <laughs> and I think it's one of the um, joys of teaching clever young people like Eleni that um, is to really to interact with young people that have really good ideas. And it is when people are young that they often have the most exciting scientific ideas. A lot of the famous scientists like Heisenberg and particularly those who founded the field of quantum mechanics, the modern explanation for the structure of atoms, they were really young when they came up with their big ideas in their early 20s. And they then went on to become um, older professors, but their really exciting work was done when they were quite young. Sometimes when you're my age, it's a bit depressing to think that your earlier work might be much more exciting than what you're doing now, but I still really enjoy what I'm doing now. And can, Martin, can you remember your first experiment ever done? Um, well, um, I think, um, well, I can remember the first experiment we did at school in chemistry, 
which was, um, I think, heating up iron and sulfur. The idea of the experiment was to demonstrate the difference between a physical mixture and a chemical reaction. So the idea was that you heated up iron and sulfur, and before you heated it, you could show that with a magnet, you could pull the iron out of the sulfur. But when you heat it up, it forms iron sulfide, a chemical compound, which is not magnetic. So when you put a magnet there, you cannot separate it anymore. And then as an extra bit, we added acid and there was a terrible smell of hydrogen sulfide. It smells of rotten eggs. So that's what we did. Mm -hmm. But when I think about my, um, my time at school, I think the first experiments that I really did, which experiment in the scientific sense, where you have a hypothesis and then you test it, my first experiment was when I was about 12 and I could not swim at school. I didn't know how to swim and all the other boys were making fun of me. So I came up with a hypothesis that if I jumped into the deep end of the swimming pool, because I would be out of my depth, I would have to swim. Mm -hmm. So I got special permission from the head teacher to jump into the deep end and with a lot of the school watching I jumped into the unoccupied swimming pool and I sank to the bottom and had to be pulled out on a long pole <laughs> and so I demonstrated that the theory was wrong yeah. <laughs> but it was like many experiments in science. It turned out to be an experiment to prove something else. <laughs> Still so, a successful one. <laughs> it, so in this case, it turned out to be an experiment to prove how to become a hero in the school. <laughs> because the head teacher said to everyone, look at Polyakov, how brave he is jumping into the pool when he can't swim. And there was another boy called Richard who could swim but was too frightened to jump into the swimming pool. And so the TED teacher said, look at Polyakov and look at you. So that was probably my first scientific experiment. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you reach out to your students with patience and uh, understanding? Have you ever taught someone uh, who you felt would outdo you some uh, day? Oh, well, I mean, the statistically, with we have quite big classes. Some of our classes have more than 200 students. So statistically, I'm sure that several of the students are cleverer than me. <laughs> and the only reason that I'm a professor and their students is because I'm old and they're young, not because I'm cleverer than they are. And I have some very clever students, not just Eleni, but other <laughs> ones as well. And I'm sure lots of them are cleverer than me and more successful. And you love teaching. Eleni, how, how was it to have Professor uh, Polyakov teaching you? Well, I can, I can tell you that he loves teaching, so that's why he has got a lot of patience. So this is something he loves doing. And he always finds time for his students. So maybe there is a small queue outside of his office to speak to him. Or nowadays, maybe the queue is larger because he's so much more popular with the periodic videos that, than he used to be when I was uh, in Nottingham. Well, um, but he always finds time for them, yeah? Is well, the queue that's... larger now, Martin? <laughs> well, that's very kind of you to say that. I'm not sure it's always true. I should say that my student, Steve, the one who proved that my thesis was wrong, who sadly has died some years ago, but 
he was my first PhD student. And he thought that I was very bad at explaining things. So if he didn't understand my explanation, he would make me do it again and again till he understood it. <laughs> and although this was very irritating, it was fantastic training for me. So I think an awful lot of our students need to be very grateful to Steve for putting me through this training. Mm -hmm. I must explain to Stratos that, you know, because of um, his style and he looks very composed and um, introverted, he has a tendency to attract strong personalities. So mm -hmm. his group is full of strong personalities and he he's the source of a lot of arguments because since he's, as he says, like with, for Steve, um, he has a lot of arguments and he likes to explain things and his strong characters being in his group, there mm -hmm. are a lot of uh, heated conversations. Mm -hmm. So it's a contrast. I think he attracts such personalities. That's why the discussions with him are always interesting. And he has a lot of patience through this discussion. Well, I hope I do. Perhaps I've got less patience as I'm older. <laughs> but I should say that I had not imagined that I would still be teaching at my age because there used to be a definite um, retirement age in the UK. And the year before I reached what would have been the retirement age, I called the um, HR, the Human Resources Department at the university and said, what about retirement? And they said, the law has changed. You don't have to retire. You can go on till you're 100 if you want to. So I'm still here. I'm not 100, even though I look very old. Uh, professor, what makes you so sweet tempered? Do you follow your son Simon advice? Don't be, don't be pompous like other professors? Um, well, first of all, well, I try and follow his advice. But um, I suppose I just try and be as relaxed as I can do. It's not good for one's health to get too angry with people. <laughs> and um, though that's not necessarily something that people can control. But I'm just me. So there is. Um, and I suppose being moderately successful does give you a certain degree of self-confidence. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you have to be careful because it's very easy to become arrogant. Yeah. Or not to become arrogant, but to appear arrogant to other people. Yeah. And uh, Strato, I will share with you there, there is an incident where I, I, I was quite frustrated mm -hmm. um, during my first year when none of my experiments were working. And I rushed into uh, Martin's office. At the time, there was no queue. And so he, he admits me in and I just storm in a, a bag full of Mediterranean emotions. And he being calm as this. And so I just try to explain how disappointed I am. My experiments don't work in my usual Mediterranean style. You can imagine the British education contrast and the natural Mediterranean um, tendency for disaster and drama. And so Martin points, uh, points to me out of his office. There is a street lamp. I don't know if the street lamp is still there, Martin. Yeah, and there is. Yeah, and there is the, the street lamp is just uh, uh, at the window level and it's dusk time and the street lamp uh, is a sodium lamp which just starts to switch on and the light when the sodium identification is red and then progressively gets yellow. So he said, Eleni, look at the lamp. It's sodium burning and turning. You can see the characteristic red color and then progressively it turns orange. 
And I'm so frustrated by this, but at the same time, I understand that, you know, Martin is trying to show to me the big picture of things. And mm. he, the, the meaning of this is just like, look, life is much more complex than you think. It's not only your first year. It's what we get out of it and your experiments may not be, you know, providing you with all the answers you want, but they're at least giving you what he said before, some answers and disproving what you're trying to show is still important. He didn't say this, but all this allegory is an early sign of him moving on to the periodic videos, yeah? But at the same mm -hmm. time, being patient with somebody storming in and saying, look, I'm so much disappointed mm -hmm. with nothing working. Well, um, I don't remember this. No, of course. And I mean, I remember the street light. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> The street light is still there, but it's been oh, replaced. Yeah. Yeah. And now it has light emitting diodes. Okay. Like the a phone. Yes. So it switches on to maximum brightness straight away. Okay. So I suppose it now fits with the modern expectation that people want instant success. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, I'm really sorry you got frustrated. Um, and but you have been very successful since so. only the first year martin only <laughs> yeah. the first year later on everything went better you know yes but i have come to the conclusion that men uh, of great achievement are the most open and accessible ones isn't it huh? um well i think that, that that's very kind of you to say i don't think that's true um I have met quite a few people who are Nobel Prize winners. And a few of them are really so modest, you wouldn't realize they'd ever won the Nobel Prize. But some of them are really arrogant. Mm. And there's one, I won't tell you his name, who's now dead, but I heard him giving a lecture, must have been about 35 years ago, and he said he was really proud he had won a medal from the American Chemical Society, which was only given once every 100 years. And he was really proud of winning this because his friends couldn't win it. And um, so I think, I suppose that when people get older and successful, they can go in one of two directions. They can either become more arrogant, more dictatorial, perhaps more unpleasant to others, mm. or they can go the other way and become more modest. Yeah. Or you can I, just keep going much the same as before. Mm -hmm. So yeah. perhaps three different ways. Uh, I remember in the opening ceremony of the Chemistry Olympiad in uh, 2008, I was in the USA and um, I was there as a mentor of the Greek delegation and a uh, chance to sit next to uh, a gentleman with whom we began to talk. After uh, talking a while, I asked him about his occupation and he said he was a professor in a, an American university. So the opening ceremony started and the presenter gave the floor to the novelist Richard Schrock. At uh, the moment, the gentleman next to me started to get up. And my first reaction was to tell him, but where are you going? A Nobelist is going to talk now. Needless to say, he was the Nobelist. Yes. And uh, when he came back, we uh, talked extensively. Uh, so, so yeah, probably you are right. Eh? Yes. Well, I, I, I know Richard Schrock. He, um, he was a postdoc. I mean, that is somebody doing research after his PhD. When I was a PhD student, in Cambridge, and um, he borrowed a piece of equipment from our laboratory, which then disappeared. So I've always remembered this, but he's a really nice guy. And I think your story is completely in character. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Professor, how did you start to create a video for the internet? And how was the idea conceived? Why did you do it? What need would you say was met through this? Oh, the, the, that's very easy to answer. Um, in 2007, 
Nottingham was declared um, city of science for one year. And though we still like to think we're city of science, but this was some um, official one year nomination. And as part of that, our university hired a video journalist to make videos about the university or about science at the university. And that journalist, Brady Harron, started making videos about scientists at the university for YouTube. This was very early on. YouTube was only um, was only about 18 months old, so it was very early on. And about after he'd been doing this for six months or so, I went to a, a meeting where one of his videos was shown, a sort of compilation video. And I got really excited and wrote to our communications department at the university to see how to say how impressed I was. And so I was asked to make some videos with him. So it was a day where I'd done a lot of teaching just before the exams. And Brady came and we shot about eight videos in um, in one sitting. They were all quite short. Um, one of them was about my hair and why I looked like Einstein. Mm. Another one was um, I talked about how I had done very badly in my exams as a student. I nearly failed my exams. And that video is still really quite loved by some of our present students. And um, I made, we also, I showed how um, I use dog toys for teaching. And in particular, I showed this um, toy, which is called the Wiggly Giggly. It looks like a molecule of methane. But the point is that when you rotate it, it squeaks. And the students really like this. And in fact, the person who, in those days, that was 12 years ago, who imported these into the UK, was so excited by seeing this video on YouTube that he sent me a box with 12 more of these <laughs> wiggly gigglies. So I have a whole box full in my office now. <laughs> but so we made these videos and I thought that was the end of it. But Brady liked me and a few weeks later, he said he'd had the idea of making one video about each element of the periodic table. And I told him he was mad because it's easy to make a video about hydrogen or sodium, they explode. But at that time, element 117 hadn't had even one element, one atom of that element had been made. So how can you make a video about an element that doesn't exist? But he persuaded me that it was worth trying. And I found a small amount of money to pay for this. But the money had to be used very quickly. So we made 118 videos one about each element in the periodic table over a period of five weeks. And um, well, we made 120 because there was an introduction and a sort of trailer, which was just a bit about to advertise the project. And I don't know what the situation is like in um, Greece, but in the UK in the summer, there is not very much news for the newspapers. The politicians are on holiday. It's a bit boring. So these mad scientists putting up all these videos about chemistry on YouTube really hit the headlines. So by the end of the five weeks, we had quarter of a million views, which was by in those days quite a large number. And most importantly, the um, the people watching started writing comments saying, whatever you do, please don't stop. So what I thought was just going to be a short project 
has got going. And today we've just put up our 682nd video about the element Einsteinium. The first time there were some elements we didn't know very much about. And my favorite video in the first 118 was about the element Hassium, number 108. And I was videoed, and I didn't realize it, saying, I know nothing about Hassium, shall we make something up? And that was the beginning of the video. Later on, Brady and I went to Darmstadt in Germany, where they synthesized um, Hassium for the first time, and we actually saw the equipment where it had been made, and so we made a much better video. And our latest video, the one that was released today, is about the element Einsteinium, where we could say something rather more interesting than my hair looked like Einstein. So it was, I hope people will find it very interesting, but it's a bit like gambling. You watch the numbers going up as people watch the video. And so I'm hoping for a big success. Professor, have you explored the audience that follows your work? Uh, the audience, well, they're in about 200 different, at least 200 countries. And they cover everybody from um, really quite young children, three or four years old, up to um, Nobel Prize winners and 80-year-olds. And I get quite a few um, emails from people. And because of my hair, I'm very easy to recognize. So I have been stopped all over the world, um, from, from Vancouver in the west to um, Beijing in the east, and from Helsinki in the north down to Johannesburg in the south. So I've been stopped by fans all over the world. And there's really quite a nice group at the moment of about a dozen children aged from um, about, I think the youngest one is still five, and the oldest one's about 11, who meet on Zoom every Saturday to discuss chemistry. <laughs> and they're right across the world, one in Singapore, one in Malaysia, one in Germany, three, I think, in the UK, and quite a few in the United States. And they all meet to discuss chemistry. Mm -hmm. And they're very clever, much cleverer than I was at that age. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that there are unexplored secrets in the periodic table? Um, well, I think, well, I think the thing that's really nice about chemistry is that there's surprises all the time. There was a paper that I was talking to my students about today which was published, I think, a couple of weeks ago, in which a German professor has discovered that calcium can bind to dinitrogen, N2. And nobody had realized this before or expected it. And so I was, it was quite nice. I could say to the students, look, there's something new. And one group looked a little bored, the second one got quite <laughs> excited. Um, I should say, uh, when you were asking about our viewers, that we have a few viewers who, young viewers who come and um, visit us. And there was a um, Italian boy called Eduardo, who came to visit us for his 10th birthday, his parents brought him to visit us. And then um, in 2019, out of the blue, I got an email saying that he was still studying chemistry and had got the highest score in chemistry in Italy and was a member of the Chemistry Olympiad team. So I felt quite proud of our graduates. Yeah. Did, did you happen to discover any unknown properties of an element while making a video du during Well, this? We, we discovered some things 
no, we've never discovered anything that nobody has known before, mm -hmm. but we've discovered things which we didn't know before. <laughs> and um, for example, you know, there's a soft drink called Seven Up, mm. and Seven Up used was called Seven Up originally because it used to contain lithium, which is element number seven in the periodic table. And they stopped putting lithium in 7-Up, I think, in the 1940s. But we thought it would be an amusing experiment to put some metallic lithium into 7-Up. We thought because lithium reacts with water, there would be bubbling and hydrogen. But the surprising thing we discovered was that it went quite red. <laughs> and we did some experiments and decided that this was really caused by some reaction between the sugar and the alkali that is produced by the lithium. But exactly what the red product is, we never, we didn't have a chance to find out. Mm -hmm. But it's quite nice when we're making the videos, we can do something and show students or show viewers how, as scientists, if we observe something that's a bit unexpected, we can then um, do some experiments to see whether our explanation is correct. Yeah. Uh, can science, can chemistry become viral? Can science communication help in that? Can chemistry, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Can, uh, can become popular, like a uh, viral, you know, and, uh, and uh, if uh, science communication is something that can join uh, publicity and uh, science? Yeah, well, I think some of our videos have become viral. <clears throat> I mean, my understanding from observation of what a viral video is, is one which, sadly, rather like the pandemic, it can flare up and then go very quiet, and then suddenly lots more people watch it and so on. Our most successful video, which has been watched by 19.8 million people, is, um, or million views, they may not all be individual people, um, is one that I'm really quite ashamed of. It is taking a McDonald's cheeseburger and putting it in concentrated hydrochloric acid for the simple reason to um, that, well, our excuse for doing this was that there is hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Mm -hmm. But our second most popular video, which has had nearly um, 10 million views is about the chemistry of plutonium, and that's completely serious. And I'm really surprised so many people have watched it. And the third one has a strong Greek connection that one of my um, uh, postdocs went to Greece and bought what is called a Pythagoras cup. Mm. <laughs> and um, this is a cup which, if you feel too full, all the wine falls out. Yeah. And we decided we would try an experiment to see if this Pythagoras cup would work if you filled it with mercury. <laughs> and it does feel, work with mercury. But we also showed that if Pythagoras had put a little mercury in the bottom of the cup, he could then have filled it with wine right to the top and it wouldn't have come out. So, um, but for some reason, that video has been very successful. And the fourth video, which has been really successful, was um, Brady and me visiting to the gold vault of the Bank of England, which contains 4,000 tons of gold. And we didn't see all of it, but we saw a huge amount of gold, uh, which was quite interesting. But 
a bit sad. It was a bit like a cemetery with all this gold sitting there. And I suppose the fact that I um, learnt um, is that every block of gold, ingot of gold, has a number, rather like a car has a registration number. And when you buy and sell gold, it's just that that registration number is transferred from one computer account to another one. And it's all kept self safe in a vault, like in the Bank of England. Yeah. Uh, Professor, what inspires you in life? Um, well, that's a difficult question, and I don't know the answer to it. Um, I Well, I enjoy doing chemistry. I enjoy communicating it. And I think scientific research is a bit like a drug. You get, as I mentioned before, you get really excited when you discover something or your colleague, your co-workers discover something. So you keep on wanting to discover more and more. And but I also like reading. You can see there are lots of books there. And um, so I suppose I'm just interested in learning things. I'm interested in history. When I was at school, before I did any science, um, I did a lot of history and I liked history because history, at least when I was young at school, involved a huge amount of memory. Not much understanding, actually. It was rem remembering this date and that date and so on. And I also like languages. Um, when I was um, 12, 13, I learned, I was learning French, Latin, and ancient Greek. <laughs> but I never learned modern Greek. Yes, and, I forgot... and you don't remember your ancient Greek, right? <laughs> no, I don't remember much. I, c I can read a few words, yes. but um, my, my great uncle, that's my mother's uncle, used to teach Latin and Greek. Um, but now I, I still speak French, though it's a bit rusty, and I speak Russian quite fluently, and um, I speak German a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, with which chemical element would you identify yourself with the most and why? Um, I don't really know. I'm not sure anybody's ever asked me that question. <laughs> they quite often ask me what is my favorite element. And I think the problem about um, identifying with a chemical element is that even those elements I thought were quite boring have turned out to be quite exciting. So, and I definitely don't know all the properties of the elements. So I don't really know which element I um, identify with. It would probably be better to turn the question around and ask you and Eleni <laughs> which element I remind you of because <laughs> you're in a better position to judge, perhaps. Definitely Einsteinium, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> well, perhaps, though, um, I did, you should watch this video because I discovered mm -hmm. some quite interesting things about it. Yes. That when they were trying to <laughs> separate it, the, the whole beaker exploded in the fume cupboard and they had to scrape it off literally off the walls of the fume cupboard um but um so what do you think stratos uh i would agree definitely with uh, what eleni said uh einsteinium is uh, exactly what uh, what i had in mind yes well um so um einstein visited nottingham in the 1930s. And apparently his visit was a disaster. <laughs> First of all, because his host was quite a young professor and Einstein 
demanded to borrow money from the professor. I mean, quite a lot, nearly a month's salary at those days, and then took three months to pay it back. <laughs> but much worse was that in those days, Einstein didn't lecture in English. So he lectured in German. And the university brought together for the audience physics students and students studying German. And the students who studied physics couldn't understand what he was saying in German. And the German students couldn't understand the physics. <laughs> so nobody really understood the lecture. But the blackboard that he wrote on is still preserved, covered in glass and hanging in the physics department. Very nice. Uh, would you say that the bond with your family is more covalent or ionic? Is it more about sharing or give and take, would you say? Um, well, I like to think it is about sharing. So I think <laughs> covalent. <laughs> Though with the more distant members, perhaps it gets more like a hy hydrogen bond, that it's a definite <laughs> interaction, but perhaps slightly weaker. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, unfortunately, time passes so quickly. So at this moment, uh, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your presence here today with us. Uh, we have become richer in knowledge and uh, have come to better know a man and a scientist who is very dear to all. And Martin, it's been an honor to have you here with us today. Thank you very much. It's, I'm delighted to meet you, Stratos, and it's a huge pleasure to see Eleni again. Yes. And I you. must say, as a remote team, the two <laughs> of you managed to work together really well. So thank you for asking me such interesting questions. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Sir Martin Polyakov. Good night. <laughs>